Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start off with a picture that a lot of us are probably, unfortunately, familiar with. It's 2.30 AM, it's the weekend, and your pager has just gone off. It's that pesky service again, the one that keeps giving you problems, the one that was supposed to be tier two, right? The one that was not supposed to take the site down. It's one that's maybe been causing you issues for the past week, maybe for the past month. Maybe you've actually seen this issue before. You come in Monday morning with an idea. You say, I've heard about chaos engineering. It's this cool new buzzword, and I think it might help here. I think it's supposed to help with these kinds of things. But maybe you don't have a lot of information on it. And when you first say the words chaos engineering to your manager, she might look at you like this. And you say, no, 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 no. The, the system's already chaotic. Chaos engineering allows us to expose these weaknesses before we get paged at 2.30 AM on the weekend. But maybe your manager also argues, well, we have a lot of other forms of testing. Why don't we just beef up those ways to increase our confidence? So let's talk about that for a second. What are some known ways to increase confidence other than chaos engineering that we as an industry are already pretty familiar with? Well, one, there's unit tests. So unit tests are on a component level, and it's a known, right? You're testing a known. So given an input, say I input x, I expect y to be outputted. And it's however many knowns that you come up with for your unit tests. And your integration tests are similar, similar except you're working between components, right? Maybe um, how component A and component B work together or how on a service level component, or on a service level how things work together. But you're still testing knowns here, right? It's, it's only what you think to test. So now that we've addressed some knowns, let's define chaos engineering. So my name's Nora Jones. I'm a senior chaos engineer at Netflix. I've previously had the opportunity to work at startups and execute chaos on that scale, and now I'm getting to execute chaos on Netflix scale. So I've gotten to do it in two very different scenarios. So defining chaos engineering in a simplistic definition, and this is from the principlesofchaos.org website, chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in production in order to build confidence in the system's capabilities to withstand turbulent conditions. It's a new way to increase confidence. Right, we have, our, we have our known ways through unit and integration tests and whatever else you may have. But this is a new way to increase confidence. And my colleague and teammate Haley Tucker argues that both sides of the equation are, are needed. The integration and unit testing side and also the chaos engineering side. One is not meant to replace the other. So let's go into what chaos experiments are. So they look a lot like Integration, the integration testing diagram that we were looking at earlier. Except you'll notice that we call these experiments here. Because with chaos, we're not testing knowns, we're looking at unknowns, right? So it's not a test anymore, it's an experiment. And so with chaos experiments, we can go from service C to service D, and we can either fail those calls, or we can add latency to them. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. So now that we understand a little bit what chaos is, there's still kind of a fear behind it, right? But I argue, why is there a fear behind it when chaos is inevitable? I mean, companies literally exist to manage your incidents, right? Obviously, we have a ton of incidents if there are companies whose sole purpose is, is to help us manage them. So obviously, the chaos is there. The chaos that we're building in our systems is inherent. It's up to us whether we want to expose it before the customer does so that we can deal with it and it doesn't turn into a pager at two in the morning. I hear a lot of this though. I hear a lot of the, it doesn't apply to me fallacy. And uh, you know, people think, okay, Netflix can do this because people are just streaming movies, right? What, what's the big deal if they can't stream movies? But a lot of other high stakes companies are doing this as well. Um, in some domains, such as finance, system failures can be extremely costly. 
the Knight Capital Group, a U.S. trading firm, is famous for losing over $400 million because of a software configuration issue. How many people in here have had an incident over a software configuration issue? Yep. <laughs> In other domains, such as transportation, a system failure can lead to injury or loss of life. The stakes are super high there. And it's not surprising that stakeholders in these domains are reluctant to run experiments on production systems. But because of the increased impact of these systems, like because of the increased impact of failing these systems could have, I would argue that chaos engineering should actually have a higher importance in companies like this and it even applies to you more. Recently, I got the opportunity to define some of the principles and the discipline behind chaos engineering uh, in a book with my colleagues at Netflix. Casey, Lauren, Aaron, and Ollie and I all worked on this book. And we talk about how we perform chaos at Netflix scale, the discipline and safety behind chaos engineering, and then we also talk about how it can apply to you as well. And like I mentioned earlier, I, I used to be able to, I used to work at, on chaos engineering at a startup called Jet.com. And I actually got the opportunity to introduce chaos there. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of what I saw introducing it at that startup, and then we're gonna go into how we do it at Netflix scale. So there's a bunch of different forces of chaos that we can introduce when we're advocating for it. Force zero, socialization and monitoring. These are two things that are of utmost importance before you begin your journey into chaos, before you even begin writing code in chaos. You need to make sure that you understand your company's culture and you have good monitoring in place. So what do I mean by socialization? Two things here. Acknowledge the complexity of your systems, whether you're a startup or a super large scale internet company, your systems are complex. And you also need to define the steady state. What, what is normal, right? What, what is our hypothesis? What, how does our system behave when it's behaving normally? And I hear this a lot. But Nora, I work at a startup, there is no steady state. <laughs> and I, I experienced this at Jet.com too. I, when I started at Jet.com, it was my second week, and I had a situation like the story I told earlier. It was a weekend, and you know I was observing how people did on call there, and there was an outage that took the site down for an entire day over a weekend period. And it was something that could have really been caught with chaos engineering, right? And so I tried to, as I was wanting to introduce it, I tried to find out the steady state. So I asked people, hey, is there documentation in place? And I kind of got laughter, right? There's no, there's no documentation in startups when you're working in full scale. There's, there's also not a lot of documentation at big companies sometimes as well. Um, so here are some of my tips for defining steady state when it, it might be a little hard. I would suggest to start with non-critical services, right? If you, if you define them in terms of tiers, tier two, maybe tier three services, start in a staging environment possible. Do not start in production. It, you, are ex you are learning about the chaos too. You are learning about your tools for the first time. You don't wanna start in a production environment with real customer traffic. Um, and my, my last point is to only include the teams and services that want to be chaos. You're gonna get people that are really excited about this, and you're gonna get people that are apprehensive um, as well. Start with the people that are excited. Build those success stories. Um, and the people that are excited are usually ones that have more of a steady state too, and they'll be able to kind of share that with you and you can work with them on that. So has anyone here heard of the game Total War Warhammer? Okay, a lot of hands. So um, as I was introducing chaos at Jet.com, my uh, boyfriend then, my now fiance, was very obsessed with this game. And he was on a level where there was this guy kept popping on the screen 
saying, the armies of chaos are coming. And he wasn't playing it with headphones on, and we were living in a studio at the time. And I just kept hearing this over and over again, the armies of chaos are coming, the armies of chaos are coming. And it was around the time that I was beginning to introduce chaos at Jet.com. And I was like, this is really annoying, but it's also really funny, right? <laughs> He's letting people know pretty regularly that his armies of chaos are coming. Do I need to let people pretty regularly know that my armies of chaos are coming? Is it truly chaos if I let them know, or do I just let them find out? So we'll come back to that in a little bit. So I would strongly advocate that part of your job as a chaos engineer or as an SRE or as the people that are developing these internal tools for, for chaos experiments, part of your job is, is to understand the customer and their needs. And I mean both your company's customer and your service teams, your, your internal customers, your coworkers. So understand what their concerns are, understand what you're optimizing for, and in the, in the big picture, you're optimizing for availability. You're op optimizing for your company's customer happiness. So we've talked about socialization a little bit. Let's talk, let's talk about monitoring. Your key business metrics are very, very important when you're doing chaos engineering. If you don't have these in place, you really need to sit with your business and define what your key business metrics are. What are the things that need to be up all the time in order to keep our business running, in order to keep our customers happy? So at Netflix, we call our key business metric SPS, or stream starts per second. I know that's SSPS, but we call it SPS. And so stream starts per second are actually how often people or how often uh, the play button is being pressed, right? So if something happens like this, we'll see a dip in SPF, SPS. If someone's trying to press play and it's not working, we'll see uh, a spike in SPS. So we monitor that pretty regularly. We monitor these stream starts per second very regularly. Uh, Jet.com is an e-commerce company. So we had a lot of key business metrics and they were also very different than Netflix's key business metrics. And we were a startup too, so we were trying to get new customers to use the site. Our biggest key business metric was, can someone add to cart? So that was something that we wanted to keep an eye on because if they could not add to cart, they weren't already signed up as a customer, they weren't already subscribing to the service, they would probably just never come back. And we actually found through our metrics that they usually did not come back if they couldn't add to cart. So that was a key business metric that we wanted to keep an eye on at Jet.com. So really here, it's extremely important to not lose sight of your company's customers as you're doing this. It's fun and it's easy to get into the engineering weeds of this, but it's very, very important to remember why you're doing this, and that's to preserve availability and cu customer happiness. So now that we've defined monitoring and we've defined um, socialization, We've done force zero. Let's move on to force one, graceful restarts and degradation. Who's heard of Chaos Monkey before? Cool, a lot of hands. So um, this is the most basic form of chaos that I recommend introducing. Are we resilient to a single node or single instance failover? And if you're deployed in a cloud service like AWS, at the very minimum, you should be resilient to single node failures to your cluster. Chaos Monkey at Netflix is actually open sourced if you'd like to check that out. And a lot of that hard work was put in by my, my teammate, Lauren Hochstein. So let's go back to this guy. So as I mentioned, when I was at Jet, um, I was trying to introduce chaos, right? And I was trying to see how often I should tell people. So in level one, I was just doing graceful restarts and degradation. And it was things that had bitten us, right? We, we weren't resilient to single node failures at that time. And so I decided to send out um, an email to all my coworkers, and I said, here are the services that are eligible for our first round of, of chaos experimentation. Let me know if you have any concerns. So I kind of did a, an opt-out model there. And that's, that's probably something I shouldn't have done. I probably should have done an opt-in model. And so it was my second week, and I, and I didn't fully know the communication structure at Jet yet. Right? I didn't know if people used email most often, or Slack, or face-to-face. -face. So 
you know, I sent out that email and I didn't get a lot of responses, right? And so I started going up to people's desks and, and telling them, hey, you know, we were bitten by this issue recently. We're going to start implementing chaos now. Here are the services that are eligible. Let me know if you have any concerns. And I still didn't really hear much back. And so I finally decided that it was probably OK if I wasn't hearing much back. <laughs> so we can see where this is going to go. <laughs> I decided it was OK, and I implemented chaos. And I, luckily, I did this in QA. But all the coworkers I hadn't met yet, I met them all that week. <laughs> I think I met everybody at that company that week, from people in the business to PMs to engineers, all of my coworkers. So um, while working on chaos is a, is a quick way to meet your new colleagues, it's not a great way sometimes if not executed properly. So I had, to, I had to think about my communication structure a little bit better. So I had people that were still interested in this, right? I mean, we took down QA for a reason. Like, there, there, were, uh, there were things that we found doing this that might have made their way into production if we hadn't been doing it. And so I had some fans at this point. I also had some people that were not interested. So instead, I moved to an opt-in model. I focused on those people that, I, that wanted to participate in it, those service teams that wanted to participate in it. Um, oops. And we talked about targeted chaos. So at this point in Jet.com, we were deployed in two regions, and we were trying to work on our regional failovers. And we were very reliant on Kafka when we were doing regional failovers. So we wanted to make sure we were resilient to Kafka going down. That was our hypothesis. We are resilient to this. Our steady state is that it's working properly. And so we started coming up with scenarios to target chaos Kafka and see if that would work properly. So some of the things we did was we changed the offsets in Kafka, see if it could pick up from, from the point that we knew it should pick up from. Um, we also s placed a bunch of load on certain topics uh, to see if those would perform properly. We fed it some bad data to see if that bad data would get carried over into the other region. We partially deleted some topics. We fully deleted some topics. And again, our hypothesis with each of these experiments was that we would be resilient to these failures. And we found out that we weren't. And luckily, we were able to find that out before we went into a failover situation. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without these kinds of chaos experiments in place. So force three at jet.com was trying to cause a ca cascading failure. And I'm sure a lot of us here are familiar with cascading failures, but these are the bugs that lie dormant for a long time until they're triggered by an unusual set of circumstances. Um, in those circumstances, it re it's revealed that the software was making some kind of assumption and that assumption, assumption no longer turns out to be true. So a bunch of the service teams that were opted in at this point, and they were downstream services of each other. We all got in a war room together. And we were watching our key business metrics on the screen. And we tried to execute a cascading failure. We tried to cause one. And we did, in fact, cause one, but we did not cause the one that we intended to cause. So all of a sudden, search wasn't resulting in data anymore. Pricing was seeing timeouts. Search wasn't handling those pricing timeouts. And then it led to the realization that Elasticsearch was completely down. Luckily, we were still doing this in QA. We didn't bring it down in production. But it's something that would have occurred in production had we not caught it. Um, so we were getting a lot of fans of chaos at this point to the point where we felt comfortable moving into, into production. And I actually saw the culture at Jet change from people not asking what happens if this fails to what happens when this fails. When I joined Netflix, I was lucky enough that that was already the culture. Netflix had been doing Chaos Monkey for a while now. And when I joined, they were at the point that they had already built a failure injection framework. Um, and it was built from learning experiences from one of Netflix's Simeon Army monkeys. Has anyone here heard of the Simeon Army before? Yep, a lot of hands. 
So that was what I knew Netflix uh, chaos engineering program for as well. But what I didn't know at the time was that they had been bitten by a lot of the monkeys, and a lot of the monkeys were learning experiences. So I learned about latency monkey. Now latency is one of the worst problems in our systems because it keeps you hoping for an answer. When things fail fast, at least you can start working on the next thing. And before my time at Netflix, we wanted to understand what the impact of latency was on um, a downstream, uh, the impact that latency would have on from a downstream service to its upstream. So we impacted one of the services that should not have been critical, and it ended up turning out being critical, right? And la latency monkey kind of went rampant. There was no stopping it. There were no good safety mechanisms in place. So we like to call Latency Monkey a learning opportunity. <laughs> and it taught us that we should place more of an emphasis on safety. So let's go into Force 4, a failure injection framework. So Netflix built a failure injection testing framework. And at a high level, I'm going to go over a sample failure injection library so that you can understand how it works. This isn't the failure injection testing library that we use at Netflix. It's unfortunately not open source yet, but it'll give you an idea of, of how, how it works to an extent. So here's our main chaos function, and this is written in F-sharp if anyone's curious. We don't use F-sharp at Netflix, but it's nice for presentation purposes. So our let chaos function has three different parameters. We have name, which is the type of chaos that we're injecting, which is helpful for logging purposes. We have should chaos, which is a Boolean. Should we execute this chaos, true or false? So this is where a portion of safety comes in, right? Maybe there's certain criteria we need to make in order to, to execute this chaos. Um, and then we have our chaos function, the actual failure or latency that we are injecting. And then the async arrow here serves a unique capability for asynchronous workflows. And the dubang here does the same thing. So here's some types of chaos failures that we can introduce. At a very high level, we can fail and raise a random exception, or we can cause latency and introduce a timeout to sleep for a certain period of time. So here's the two main pieces of chaos that we'll be injecting. And then this specific criteria is to illustrate a safety mechanism, something that we need to have in place in order to execute our chaos. So something that you might want to have here is maybe we will only want to execute chaos between 9 and 5 p.m., right? Maybe we don't want to cause our developers undue stress outside of work hours. Maybe we only want to execute chaos on the holidays. Maybe we only want to execute chaos when the service is healthy. There's a bunch of different requirements that you can um, pre-put in, and so when your should chaos executes, it checks those requirements beforehand and will only execute the failure or the chaos if those requirements are met. And then a simple API that defines our chaos, and it allows us to pipe it in, pipe in a random exception, or pipe in random latency. So now that we know how the chaos works, uh, how the failure injection works at a high level, we can talk about how Netflix does it. So Netflix has several building blocks that are key uh, to Netflix's success. And these are some of them. We have, we have EV cache, we have AWS S3, AWS SQS, RPC clients, RPC services, Cassandra, and our circuit breaker mechanism, Hystrix. And so we have failure injections at all these different points. And the way failure injection library worked is that um, we would check those injection points, and if one of them met the criteria, we would either fail that call or make it latent from service A to service B. And this was great. This was a great first start. However, we didn't have the opportunity to control traffic, right? So you can see how it could still get run rampant like Latency Monkey did. And so we decided to build on top of this a chaos automation platform. And the idea was of, with a chaos automation platform was to focus on safety, 
was to allow us to control that traffic so we know the limit uh, of the blast radius that we're hitting if we're causing undue customer pain. Netflix chaos experiments in production, so customer pain could be very real. So the way the chaos automation platform works, so this is, um, this is a service from A to B, and you'll see right now normally 100% of traffic is flowing from A to B. So that key business metric that I brought up earlier, SPS, the stream starts per second, whether or not you can press play, that's something that we actively monitor during these experiments. And that's actually something that we use to calculate how much traffic is going to be routed into a chaos experiment. So we look at that current SPS, and we make a calculation that says, what is the minimum amount of traffic that I can impact based on the current SPS? And so it's a very low amount of traffic so that we don't actually have to impact customers, so that we don't have to actually cause undue customer pain. So say, for example, in this experiment that we calculated 2%. So we take that 2% and we split it in half. And we route 1% of it into a control cluster. We don't do anything with the people that are in that 1% cluster. Then we take that other 1% and we route it into an experiment cluster. And this is where we add our failure or we add our latency. And we monitor these against each other heavily as we're doing these experiments, right? And we short the experiments early if we're seeing undue customer pain. So we don't want customers to see this as a result of a chaos experiment. So we go back to SPS, Netflix's key business metric of stream starts per second. And we monitor that with the experiment and control clusters automatically during our chaos experiments. So the green line here might represent an ex uh, the control cluster, the blue line might represent the experiment cluster, and these are the SPSs for each of the 1% of traffic as our experiment's going. And if they deviate too far from each other, the experiment will automatically short. So we still watch these experiments, we still look at other metrics as we're watching these experiments, but this is something that we actively fail on because we know we're causing customer pain if it deviates too far. And we stop the experiment early, and that gives the engineer time to sit at their desk, not under the fire of pager duty or alerts or the site going down, and figure out what the issue is before it causes customer pain, before it renders you unable to watch Stranger Things or whatever you're binging on these days. We have a pretty lofty goal with CHAP, and I should mention our chaos automation platform is called CHAP. Um, our goal is to chaos all the things and run all the time. And remember all those injection points I mentioned earlier? There were a lot of those. And in order to sit with service teams and figure out what makes a good experiment, we had to have a meeting and we had to talk with them about, does this injection point make sense for you? Should we add more injection points? What metrics should we be looking at? Should we fail this? Should we make it latent? How, how, much, should, how much time should we add to the latency experiment? These meetings ended up being pretty long, and it obviously didn't scale. So if we want to chaos all the things and run it all the time, we need to automate some of it. So what's next? So looking at all these failure injection points again, you can see how it can get pretty hectic. There's so much, there's infactorial things we can do. There's infactorial experiments that we can come up with. So we decided to start automating experiment creation and prioritization. So in order to automate experiment creation, we had to get all this information ourselves without meeting with a team for two hours, without you know, taking up everybody's time, we had to look in all these different places. We wanted to get information about different fallback paths. We wanted to get information about RPC clients and uh, timeouts and um, 
Hystrix timeouts and RPC timeouts and how many retries we had. And we realized that this information lived in a lot of different places. So we took CHAP and we decided to get cute and we zoomed in and gave it a monocle. And this allowed us to combine all these different configurations that we were seeing in all these different places and we put them in one place. And this was useful for us in order to fuel and create these experiments. But we realized it was also probably useful for the service teams too, and here's why. As we were aggregating a bunch of this information together, again, we realized it lived in a ton of different places. Some of it didn't make sense together. And so this is what a sample row of Monocle looks like. We see uh, connection timeouts, we see retries on servers, we see how many requests per second we're having, we see Hystrix commands associated with it. And so in some cases we were seeing Hystrix commands, our circuit breaker with no fallbacks. Uh, we were seeing unwrapped RPC calls in some cases, so no Hystrix commands at all. We were seeing retries on the same server we were seeing Hystrix command timeouts that were higher than the RPC timeouts, indicating that the RPC timeout would actually never get executed. We saw timeouts that were clearly too high. We saw timeouts that were clearly too low. And this goes back to the configuration issue I mentioned before. Um, my colleague, Lauren, again, has this hypothesis that config changes are more dangerous than code changes. And I argue that he might be onto something here. So after we aggregated all this information, we started trying to prioritize uh, this information. We started trying to prioritize them and put them into chaos experiments and say, how often should we run these chaos experiments? What should they be set at? Um, when should they run? Different kinds of things. So we decided to make a prioritization algorithm and a criticality score. And at a high level, the criticality score looked something like this. We took uh, the RPS stats range bucket, multiplied it by the number of retries, multiplied it by the number of Hystrix commands, and ended up with a criticality score. Now we've added a few more variables to the equation and we've weighted them differently based on what's more important, but this is the gist of it. This is the gist of how the criticality score works. And the higher the criticality score, we argue the more often the chaos experiment should be run because there's more likelihood that it could fail. We also, you know, we expose this dashboard to teams, so a team could go on and see if they have an anti-pattern in place and see if they have a vulnerability. So they could even fix it before we run a chaos experiment if they think it's gonna be an issue as well. So we've talked about a lot of forces of chaos today. We've talked about socialization and monitoring, graceful restarts and degradation, we talked about targeted chaos, and we went over the example with Kafka. Uh, we caused a cascading failure, we talked about failure injection frameworks, and then we talked about chaos automation platforms. One thing that was consistent throughout all this was safety and monitoring our key business metrics. And one thing that I argue that you should do throughout every phase of, every force of chaos is to record your success stories. So I'm gonna share with you some of my favorite chaos success stories from Netflix. One of them is that, and this is directly from an internal service team owner. They say that we ran a chaos experiment that verifies that our fallback path works. And it successfully caught an issue before the fallback path resulted in an availability incident. So what does that mean? So this is a normal screen that you see when you sign on Netflix, right? You may see uh, because you watch Stranger Things row. I'm sure a lot of you see that right now. <laughs> I know I see that. Uh, you might see a continue watching row. You might see a few other things in there too. So say the continue watching row was having issues and we were running that chaos experiment on this row. Maybe the fallback path from that particular experiment was to just not show that row anymore. But what that team found out is that something like this might have happened. And just because that row has an issue, it shouldn't make all of Netflix unusable. But they realized that that might have happened and they realized that through a chaos experiment before it resulted in something like this and before we had 
unhappy customers. And so that was something that we could not do through unit or integration tests. That's something that you need real production traffic for, and that's something that they didn't expect to happen. Here's another one of my favorite ones. While failing calls, we discovered an increase in requests for the experiment cluster, even though fallbacks were successful. So they were seeing fallbacks successful here. And these are some fallback graphs that we actually add to the chaos experiments. You can look at these, and they, they look normal. But they were seeing an increase in requests. So that likely meant that whoever was consuming that fallback was retrying it. And it was causing an increase in requests, causing a retry storm. That's also something that you can't get from traditional types of testing. So if I can leave you with some key takeaways today, it's that everyone can and should be doing chaos engineering. Regardless of your scale, regardless of the, the industry you're in, the system that you're working on is inherently chaotic. And it's up to you whether you want to bring that chaos to a head before it impacts your customer and before it impacts your business. The road to chaos is a learning opportunity. You're going to want to not only monitor your key business metrics as you're going through chaos, you're going to want to monitor your culture too and see how people are approaching safety, see how people are approaching failure, and see if that's actually changing. I think the true mark of a good tool is if it changes the process and the culture. And that's a little hard to measure at times, but it's important to keep track of it in some regard as you're going down your chaos journey. Another thing is that safety is absolutely critical. You need to involve your business. You need to make it known that you're doing this and why you're doing this for your business to fortify availability to keep customers happy. And if I can leave you with one final truth today, it's that chaos doesn't cause problems. It actually reveals them. Thank you.